Alrighty, chat, let's get started. Welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alok Kanoja. Just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist, nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. And everything is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So if you all have a concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. So happy Monday, everybody. We've got an awesome guest today, Dr. Michaela Thordarson, who will explain a little bit about um, more about who she is and what she specializes in, but we're going to be taking questions, we're going to be answering questions about mental health. So, um, yeah, so that's going to start in just a second. I got to configure one or two things. Chat. Uh, all right, so that's done. Let me do this. Let me do this. 
Um, before we dive in, just a couple of quick announcements. So one is our trauma workshop that we're doing in about 12 days, I think, or 10 days or something like that. We're doing soon. Yeah, is is full. So apologies. It filled up in basically 24 hours. We're working on it. We don't want to make the size too much bigger because the whole point is that people should be able to ask questions and stuff like that. So we're working on it. We're figuring things out. You guys can still use the exclamation point trauma command to sign up for the wait list. Um, for, and then we'll do something because it seems like, you know, it's good and people like it, but we also want to run the workshop and make sure that people actually benefit from it before we sort of start scheduling another one or something like that. So thank you to everyone who's signed up so far. Um, we really hope to make it worth your while and we hope that it'll be able to help you. That's why we're doing it. And for those of you that didn't get a spot, we apologize. We're working on it. Another thing is we do have spots in group coaching. So if y'all have, or if you're interested in group coaching, um, it's a really great way to kind of understand yourself a little bit better to basically like catch up in parts of your life that are behind like forming social connections, building social skills, dealing with social anxiety, um, learning to be vulnerable, learning to connect with people, learning how to listen, learning how to give and receive authentic praise, as well as tackle challenges that a lot of people in the world are dealing with right now. So definitely check it out if y'all are interested. Um, and now we are going to hop in with Dr. Thordarson. Um, so let me go ahead and switch over to that. All right. Oh, no. It got messed up again. Hold on a second. How did this happen? Um, did I do this? Is this one? Nope. Okay. One second, chat. Technical difficulties. Hey, um, Dr. Thorson, I have more technical difficulties. I don't know what happened. This is just really bizarre. Um, we are going to... There we go. We will shrink that. Oh my god, you're zoomed in. We see a gigantic version of your face. Okay, we're going to just do this. And then we're going to do that. And then we're going to do that. Okay, this is going to have to be how it works. Can you hear us? Oh, no, you can't hear me. I'm so sorry. You're live and you don't know it. <laughs> Hi, sorry. <laughs> sorry to bother you. <laughs> sorry to startle you. I just realized that whatever I changed didn't save. And then it got even more messed up. So you've been... Oh, and I, fun. I forgot to unmute you. Oh. Um, so we've been staring at your face. And it's good that you weren't doing anything untoward <laughs> for about 10 seconds. Um <laughs> So welcome, uh, and what what would you like to go by? Um, Michaela is actually good. Okay, so Michaela, you. and you are Dr. Thorderson, right? Yes. And can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? And you've recently joined our scientific advisory board, I understand? Yes. Um, ah, gosh, where to start? That's such a big question. Um, I will say I am uh, currently in professionally doing work with a, an intensive treatment program for adolescents who are experiencing suicidal behaviors and self-harming behaviors. So that's kind of my current niche. Um, and over the course of my career, I've kind of done a bunch of different things, ranging from uh, homeless clinics, uh, mental health clinics, um, adult substance use and mental health experiences, uh, the VA system, um, schools, all sorts of kinds of different things. So I'm, I'm a little bit weird in the sense that I love to dabble in a lot of different things. I'm really interested and really excited about a lot of stuff, um, which then brings me to the awesome scientific advisory board here with you. <laughs> yes. Um, and so can you just tell us a little bit about your professional background? So what's your, like, what kind of doctor are you? Yeah, sure. So I'm a clinical psychologist with a specialty in the area of child and family, um, both development and mental health. So kind of what does it look like to be healthy in those areas, as well as what does it look like to be unhealthy in those areas? Um, yeah, I mean, my, my bachelor's degree is from UCLA from in psychobiology. So um, had early focus on uh, interactions of brain stuff with mental health and learning and behavior. Um, and I'm also bilingual in Spanish. So I have a 
a minor in Spanish as well. <laughs> cool. And and so it sounds like you focused on like development and what is healthy and unhealthy. Uh, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? So oh, how, sure. how does someone know if they have a had a healthy upbringing or not? <laughs> That's a loaded question. So um, I think the most important caveat before I even give factual information around that is that a lot of what we know around what is healthy development is is a pretty loaded context in the sense of um, they did a lot of research in these areas pretty much focused on uh, financially secure white families uh, before actually realizing that maybe other people had different experiences of, of what healthy development is. So while we have made a little bit of progress in those areas, I wouldn't say we've made a great deal of progress. So um, now to actually answer the question, how would you know if you had a healthy upbringing? Um, interestingly, if you can think about your childhood. Uh -oh. Oh. Did I just go out? Chat? Uh-oh. No. GG. Okay. Well. Let's just... I love this. <laughs> where we, where we, uh, okay. So we are going to go here. And then we're going to go here. And then we're going to wait for her to return. Let me see if I can reconnect. Okay. Well. There we go. Welcome back. Testing. What a cliffhanger. Okay. Welcome back. You okay? Um, hold on a second. We're not getting any audio. Is that me? Nope. And all right. So today we're going to be interviewing the esteemed Dr. K. Dr. K, welcome. Hi. Okay. Oh go. my gosh. We're good. The technology gods are not smiling on us today. Um, it's all good. So you were saying that it's a loaded context and we don't know what healthy is. So did... Yes. Yeah. So um, looking at the kind of factual parts, if you think about your childhood and you can reflect on a time where you had good times and they weren't just like random blips on the radar, but that you had joy, that you felt connected to people and you can say, and it wasn't perfect, right? Um, that there's a balance between how your childhood was like, that's a a decent sign um, that you probably had a more healthy upbringing, mm. um, especially the social connection piece, feeling supported, feeling like you always had somebody you could turn to or talk to if you needed something. Awesome. So what, what are some of the other things? So it seems like social connection and feeling supported is like critical to a healthy childhood. What are a couple of the other pieces that you think are important? I mean, of course making sure that your basic needs are consistently met and so of course that's that's food that's safety um housing um uh clothing you know all of those basic things and that it's not just that you had them but that you could rely on them consistently being met and then of course this kind of comes back to the social piece but the emotional needs that you felt like somebody was paying attention to you that somebody recognized your current emotional state, that somebody was checking in on you and seemed to care about you. So being uh, paying it, uh, being paid attention to people just caring about how you felt is like, yeah. like okay. And being it's able like to- like pretty work. important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a list of questions that I think people have asked. Uh, did you get those ahead of time? Oh, stun locked, GG. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do, 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 do. All righty. Well. Wrong question. Seems like it, chat. 
I hope we don't have a... Oh, no, we're back. Hello. Hold on. We're back. We're back. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can hear you. Let me I've just... rerouted through my cell phone. Okay, let's do it. That's huge. Okay, so um, I don't know if you got a, uh, the questions ahead of time or not. Otherwise, I will spring them on you and you'll be unprepared. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so um, how do you come back emotionally as an adult after being isolated as a teenager? Even when it isn't true, I still feel like the outcast and it ends up a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Um, so this is such a brutal experience. And we have so much research now about how lonely our adults are. Um, and so uh, as with kind of anything, you really want to smart start very small. So what feels like something that's a baby step outside of your comfort zone that you would be able to take, whether that's, and, and there's kind of like two branches. So there's reconnecting with people that you may have had a prior connection with, but there's also building new connections. Um, the easiest way to build new connections um, is by finding a place, whether that's in person or online, where you have people that you have some kind of shared interest with. And then you just start really small. Um, maybe that's asking about the weather, although it's like a little bit outdated. Um, maybe it's sending a funny meme or asking if somebody got a new game or saw a new movie. So so it sounds like uh, start small. Um, think about reconnecting with old people. Think about connecting with new people. What about this aspect of like, okay, so let's say I do join a community online or whatever. And then even though I'm not an outcast because I'm being invited, let's say. I still feel like an outcast and that can sometimes cause me to be in my own head. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like self-critical, self-judgmental. How can I avoid the self-fulfilling prophecy of loneliness? Yeah. Um, it can be helpful to kind of identify that voice in your head and give it some kind of a unique identity, if you will. Right. So that when you notice those thoughts are happening, you can say, whoa, Bob, nobody asked you. And you can almost like you're talking back and saying, I can't listen to you right now. You need to go in the corner, have fun with it. Use your own voice and personality. Um, but the more you can identify that that's that's the old experience trying to talk to you and keep you in your place, the more you can try to outgrow it. OK. So it's like the experiences of the past kind of live on as thoughts in our head. Yes, totally. And so rude. <laughs> and and those those experiences will try to direct your behavior even when it's kind of contrary to your current experience. And for you to sort of notice Absolutely. So so I'm I'm a little bit confused. Is that me? Is that not me? Is it right? Is it wrong? <sighs> I love this question. Um, it is both you and not you. So it is it is your brain tried to learn something from painful experiences in your past for very good reasons, right? Your brain wants to protect you and keep you safe. The problem is, is that your environment around you has changed. And especially as an adult compared to a kid, you have more control over your environment to a degree than you did as a child. And so that learning no longer applies to your current situation. And so how do you separate, hey, I need to shed this learning because it doesn't help me anymore so that I can be more successful in my new surroundings, my new environment. And how do you go about shedding that learning? Uh, practice. I mean, <laughs> a lot of my training and focus has been pretty explicitly on how do we change our behaviors um, and even though there are other ways of doing that by focusing on thoughts, changing our thoughts is, in my biased opinion, way harder than changing our behaviors. So if I can keep doing something, even though I have that like mean voice in my head that's saying, nobody likes you, you're a reject, the more I do the thing, the more my brain starts to just automatically shut that down because they're like, what are you talking about? We have friends, people like us, that guy laughed. So, you know, um, I think behaviors are a little bit easier, but it's hard. 
Yeah, so that's kind of interesting because I, I think a lot of times when we find that we have a thought in our head, we will struggle fighting in that arena, right? We'll kind of engage it in our head and we try to conquer our thoughts before we act. But hearing you kind of talk about yes. it, I'm, I'm wondering if we're sort of like letting it have the high ground and we're sort of choosing to engage it where it lives. And so we're kind of like totally. outgunned. Yeah. It's also, it's like giving a troll attention, right? It's like kind of what it wants. So when we're focusing on fighting back on the thought, we're still stuck on the thought and prevented from doing the behavior. Interesting. Okay, so so don't engage with the troll thoughts in your head. Take away number one. <laughs> um, yeah. And so when if we don't listen to those troll thoughts, sometimes it, it, those thoughts can make it hard for us to engage in the behavior. Do you have any mm -hmm. um, thoughts or advice on what to do when, you know, because that, that voice is like kind of scary. Absolutely. And um, I love how many people are like, well, just don't think about it. Um, I probably wouldn't have a job if that was doable. So how can you pick something else to replace that thought with? So it's not like, oh, I'm just going to la, 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 la. Um, but how can you say instead, like, I'm going to do this anyways, right? Don't do some like false, like everybody loves you because that's not helpful, right? Um, how can you say, I'm going to give it a shot no matter what, or, or what is going to be your, almost like a mantra, right? That you can say instead of um, listening to or giving the troll thought, like the mic, right? So give someone else a chance, but make sure it's something that you can feel like you can hold on to. Awesome. Yeah. So, so I, I really like how I, I think part of the reason that we were fans of yours is because you are not a big fan of toxic or false positivity, which we love. Um, so really yes. kind of accepting that, you know, maybe everyone doesn't love you, but they don't need to. Yeah. And they don't. If, if the standard that you hold is I want everyone to love me and then you can go chasing that. Now that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in suffering. Um, Absolutely. Can we, uh, are you up for another one? Can I shift gears a bit? Absolutely. And, you know, if you want to, like, talk more about something, just let us know. Okay? Okay. Um, so uh, we have a comment from chat. I don't know this woman, but she seems pretty cool. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay. So can you elaborate on this contradiction between the digital age enabling us to connect with people more than ever before, and yet loneliness and isolation continue to increase? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, there was recently just a, a huge study that was published that showed the, the dramatic increase in uh, experiences of depression, loneliness and suicidal thoughts for people who spend uh, over three hours a day on social media. Which I feel like is the vast majority of the population at this stage of the game, if you think about social media in, in what that term really means. Right. Um, my my current understanding because quite frankly we don't really know uh it's all such a new ball game that i think anybody who comes out and says this is the definitive answer like really um so my current understanding is that we are so connected and yet um superficially right so in a lot of social media platforms it's very filtered so we're not seeing meaningful representations of each other which is actually isolating, right? Because, oh, look at how perfect their life is. Look how much fun they have. It's not the whole gamut of a real human, which is what we get from real life experiences, right? You go out with somebody, they might fart at the dinner table and you're like, oh my God, that's so embarrassing. But like, that's, we're all human bodies or something like that, right? You call somebody and they're having a bad day. And so they snap at you. That doesn't happen in the same way when we're interacting in, in a distant format, which is that social media platform, even if it's just like DMs, forget like the profile pics and all that, or, or something like Reddit or something where you're just comment based, we're not having immediate interactions because we have the ability to filter just about everything between each other. Yeah. So that's interesting. I'm, I'm sort of like, so even there's more connection, the connection is shallower. 
So it's sort of like back in the day we used to watch movies, but now all we get is an endless amount of trailers. Yes. And and so you never yes. get to the good part. And then it's kind of like, mm -hmm. and people, you know, that's that's really fascinating. Um, any thoughts about what to do about that? Just spend less time on yeah. social media? I mean, no. oh, sure. I mean, like, yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> an option, right? I also think that when we vilify something and say that is the problem, it's too simple. So I think that um, how do we make our online connections more like complete movies rather than just the trailers, right? How do we build more meaningful connections um, with each other, especially taking advantage of some of these um, like specialty areas, right? So for example, I have a, a, a dear friend who is really into the littlest pet shop, um, is now an adult, but you know, obviously this interest started when she was much younger. Um, and she built this really wide community of friends uh, who were also children like her all the way through adulthood, um, where they could exchange pictures and talk about the things that they really loved about the different characters. And then they would um, edit them. I know that's not what you call it, but you know, we like painted and like do things differently. What is the so, littlest pet shop? Sh yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like small plastic figurines okay of an i think yeah right like okay. exactly so it's like so it's like super a random collectible kind of thing it's not like a tv show or a movie okay correct correct okay so obviously not something that a lot of people like but she was able to connect with a huge group of folks around kind of the world who were excited about this thing and through that she has built a number of really meaningful relationships that, that kind of took off from there um but I think that's the way that we make. So how do you curate your feed, right? How do you curate the servers that you're on? So that you got the fun ones and the interesting ones, but you also have the places that you're like, oh, these are my people. Or where you kind of feel that like that little button gets pushed in your heart when you when you join that or you see those posts or you go into those comments. Yeah, that's awesome. So I, I think one thing that we, I think sometimes that that place has been our Discord server for some people. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we sometimes face that I think a lot of people struggle with is that when you form connections online with someone, sometimes you can kind of like get too much, right? So people are really starving for connection. And so you'll get like trauma dumping or like, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of like, you want to form a connection with this person. This person is more than happy to form a connection. <laughs> And then they'll yes. like DM you like 15 times and send you like paragraphs and stuff like that. Any thoughts about how to deal with that or even stop from doing it yourself? Let's start with the first one. You know, if someone does that to yeah. you, how do you think you should handle that? Um, you know, I think there are a lot of people who say that's a huge red flag. And it it might be. I also think like you said, we, we're, we're all kind of starving in big ways. And it's, it's now a little bit more of like a normalized attempt at connecting than maybe it was 10 years ago, right? So how do we then instead of saying, ew, I'm gonna block you because uh, that that's that's easy and that's safe. And if that's your go to have at it, right? Um, and if you feel like you have the bandwidth to say, um, well, there, buddy, you know, or like, let's 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 pull on the reins a little bit and take our time with this or give some kind of gentle feedback to the person where you're saying, ah, uh, TMI, right? Like this is like, let's let's just kind of go a little bit slower um, and then we'll get into that after you know, we've had our first coffee together or something, you know, use a little bit of humor, be a little gentle. Now, if the other person has a really huge kind of out of hand reaction, that might be that sign that like, okay, I'm, I'm not feeling good about this. And we're all trying to figure out how to, how to use these platforms for good rather than um, the right way. Cause I just don't think we know what the right way is yet. Awesome. So like that, that sounds great. So what I'm kind of hearing is the trauma dumping is first of all, 
a more normal attempt at connection now than it used to be 10 years ago, which I would completely agree with, right? So not to say right? that it is normal, but it is becoming more standard, right? Yes, Where like I, totally. And, yeah. and so that, I think, is an amazing observation. And the second thing is that, like, since this is somewhat being normalized, you can kind of view this as a red flag. And if you kind of, if you're in a space where you really can't handle it, kind of blocking them is totally cool if that's you. But that there's an opportunity here of sort of acknowledging, hey, I realize you're, like, trying to connect with me. Um, it's a little bit too much for me right now. Offering some kind of feedback and, and really not scrapping the relationship at the first sign of danger. But then scrapping the relationship at the second sign of danger if they are not responsive to your feedback in a relationship building way. So kind of like give them a second, you know, sort of let them know, hey, this is what this is like for me. Like it feels like a bit too much too fast. And, you know, I, yeah. I'm totally fine being your friend, but like not quite in this way right this second. Can we slow things down? Yes. And if they yeah. say, screw you, then then we block them. Yeah. Totally. And I just, because we were kind of talking about that feeling of isolation and rejection earlier, I also want to say like, if that is the response, that very likely has nothing to do with you, right? So if you give somebody feedback and then they're like, OMG, like, ew, that probably is more like they're feeling afraid that you're judging them or attacking them. And so if they're trying to like slap you first um, or maybe second as like a defense mechanism, basically. So I wouldn't kind of internalize that as, oh, I made a mistake here. I would say, oh, that person just isn't ready to, to hear this feedback, hasn't had the opportunity to be corrected without also being attacked. So I think that's an important thing for, you know, one of those voices to hear in your head of like, hey, this wasn't really, I made a mistake. We're all still learning together. Awesome. Cool. Um, and then what about if you're the person who trauma dumps? What should you do then? Yeah. Um, if you think about like, like taking a rainbow and putting it in a circle. And so like each color you could think about as like increasing levels of intimacy, right? So the trauma dump is like the central color. Okay. You only get to that layer after you've crossed lots of other layers. And so sometimes giving yourself a little bit of a structure and you could literally draw this out. It doesn't have to have like the seven colors of the rainbow. Maybe make it four at, at a minimum three though. Cause you need like peripheral people who just know the bare minimum. You have the medium people who know the medium amount. And then you've got the core folks who really know your deepest, darkest secrets, your history, those kinds of things. In a perfect world, you've had a, you'd have a little bit more than like small, medium and large, but you know, you do you. Um, and then kind of think about what are things that I would be okay with a stranger knowing about me and that I would want to know about a stranger. And then kind of dial that in for, for you and what fits for you, recognizing that might not be the way other people want to um, kind of connect. Yeah, I love that. So, so it's kind of like, I mean, I like the seven because yeah. I, I, I'm almost seeing a very... Um, so one of the things that we've kind of noticed here is that the way that we socialize is changing and that like the rules of socialization, let's say 30 years ago, don't really apply in the same way today. And people basically like need to learn new ways to socialize. Um, originally, I would have called it social skills atrophy. So that that's kind of what we sort of think about where now that we're more and more online, we don't we're not as good as like at reading body language and tone and stuff like that. But the more I've started to really understand it, the more I've thought that it's just a different world. So have we atrophied? But yeah, if we consider what socialization was 30 years ago, I think there's a whole new set of skills that we need to learn to be able to socialize in the digital age. And I really like this idea of like, think about a rainbow and like start at the, you know, I don't know if we're talking about, let's assume that violet is at the top or ultraviolet or whatever, right? So like purple. And then we're going to work our way down to the more intimate feelings. And at a minimum, yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense to have seven conversations across yeah. seven interactions before you get to the strongest stuff. And whether you move down a layer depends on how they respond. So if I'm kind of... Yes. A, yeah. So go ahead. seems like... Oh, yeah. No, no. I, I, I just think sometimes that's the other thing is we end up trusting people way too quickly because we can... 
uh, you know, open up in different ways. And then that actually puts us in pretty big danger. Um, not necessarily like physical danger, but like you said, we have new kinds of danger these days. Um, and so how do we, what, what kind of what danger? we don't recognize? Oh, uh, I mean, I think we're at a significantly higher emotional danger just because of the ways that we have the protection, right? I see some things people say online that they would never say face to face to a person um, for a couple reasons. One, because we fear the physical danger that we would be in. And right, someone, if I said this to someone in person, they would maybe punch me in the face or throw something at me. Um, but I think um, the other thing is, is we have significantly less opportunities for our brains to be engaged in the empathy centers when we're typing something on a screen with letters. So that's not activating things in our empathy centers the way that a facial expression and body language does. And so I think that's a huge uh, danger. And then of course, there's also like cybersecurity pieces where someone is asking you a lot of, um, so when Facebook was like cooler, um, people would send around these like 20 questions to let your friends get to know you. And it was like mother's maiden name, street you first, like lived on first pet's name, which are all like your cybersecurity questions. And people would just go post in that stuff. Um, and so I think there's another element to that, although that's probably arguably smaller than the emotional danger. Okay, cool. And and so that <laughs> reciprocity seems important. So like, um, and what kind of danger, when you say this emotional danger, what is that, how does that manifest? Like what kind of danger are you um, talking about? What do you, what do you think happens to someone who overshares? Yeah. So I think you, uh, we, we go into an interaction, we trauma dump and basically like cut that rainbow down the middle and peel it open. Right. And then you have no idea how this person is going to respond, um, to go super extreme, right? Let's say, uh, oh, I, I share about the, the sad death of a parent, right? And then this person who I maybe have no previous interaction with says, whatever, I'm sure your mom does deserve to die. Uh, she's a dumb woman or, you know, maybe add, add some slurs in there, right? And here I just bared my whole soul and to someone who turns out to be not the nicest person who I maybe otherwise wouldn't have trusted with that information. And of course, you know, I think a lot of times when we're trauma dumping, we're sharing really personal uh, things. Uh, not that the death of a parent isn't personal, but I think um, things that feel a lot more unique to ourselves. Yeah. One of the weird dangers that I tend to see is like when when you go straight down to the red core of trauma dumping, when someone else, I, I, we don't, I don't think we think about this as a danger, but when someone else like is totally eating it up. And they're like, yeah, oh. like now that you've shared your most deepest trauma, like let me share my most deepest trauma. Oh my God, I love you so much. We were meant to be together. And then you're kind of like in this, clinically I sort of remember, I'm sort of reminded of like, um, I don't know if you've worked on any like BPD units, borderline personality disorder units, but yeah. like we would see this a lot where like two people with borderline personality disorder would have this really, really deep and powerful connection where they're cutting straight to the heart of the trauma. And then they feel so bonded over this thing. And then like, but that relationship is too, uh, got too accelerated too quickly. And there isn't enough kind of like support built up around it. So it would end up ending really badly. Um, and so sometimes I think we see this kind of like way too fast connection, which yeah. then when someone doesn't text you back for three days, you feel like they're ignoring you and like all this kind of stuff. And, and so I, I hear that. Any, any kind of thoughts, comments? Yeah. I mean, I think when you, when you do that instant, it feels so good, like in the moment. Um, and it's extremely like tumultuous because then it's almost like you lose the line and especially in a borderline personality unit, right? You lose the line between you and me and it's just weak. And so um, there's this saying, and I don't know where it's from, that in a healthy relationship, there are three people. There's the you, there's the me, and there's the us, right? And so in a relationship like that, you kind of only end up with one person, which is really hard. 
because there's actually at least two living humans in there. And so when you're so fused, your entire experience is pretty heavily impacted by this other person who probably is not super stable and I'm not stable. So we're just creating this like, whoa, situation. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of going back to this, this rainbow thing. So like what I'm kind of yeah. hearing is that, you know, what I would sort of take away from this is really to have kind of seven separate steps of like evolving intimacy. And then yeah. you kind of make sure that the other person reciprocates ideally, if not at least is like supportive. So, you know, if yeah. I kind of ask you like, hey, how's your day? And then you ask me, how's my day? Yes. That, that's how, that's when we go down to what kind of stuff do you like doing for fun? And then yes. we both kind of answer that. And then if I say, how's your day? And you say, okay. And then you don't say anything else. I don't go down to let me tell you about, I'm very, very lonely and this and that. And, you know, kind of ease into it. Yeah. Love it. Exactly. Um, can we talk a little bit about gender and health? Sure. Okay. So any thoughts on neurodivergence in women? Does the health industry mistreat, misdiagnose, and or ignore neurodivergent women? Uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we're trying to get better at that. Um, and uh, at earlier ages, women are, or so young girls, right, are socialized very strongly about what is appropriate and what is not. And then, of course, that varies depending on region, uh, racial, ethnic identity, faith-based things, right? So uh, women typically have a, a significantly higher kind of like social orientation towards what they're supposed to do, not just for themselves, but for the people around them, which ends up with a lot of masking. Or I have learned a way to show that on the outside, I kind of fit in, even if on the inside, I don't fit in at all. Um, which then, of course, leads to missed diagnoses for a long period of time. So then you get adult women who kind of have enough of that recognition to say, I don't know how well I fit in here. or I feel like there's something off. And you bring this information most commonly to like your primary care physician, but it could be really any of your physicians. And um, a lot of people are written off as, you know, maybe you just need to like calm down or maybe you're just like, you know, um, making a bigger deal out of it, or this is probably really normal. Um, and that's, that's not just like uh, male providers, that's uh, male physicians, that's female physicians. We just as a society tend to kind of um, minimize essentially what women are saying is like, no, I don't, you don't understand because, and even like, let's think from a mental health perspective, we look at distress and we look at functioning okay, well, you know, you're only in a little bit of distress and you can still do all the things you need to do. So how bad can it be kind of a thing? So I do think that there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of women out there probably who are neurodivergent who just haven't had the opportunity to learn what that is or to have the validation from a professional to say, yeah, there is something here that you could use a little bit more support around. And and so help me understand this. That's fascinating. Thank you so much, um, Michaela. L let me just ask you this. So you, you said that women are conditioned more to. Uh, 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 there's you said something like socialize more to like fit a particular role, and also in relation to mm -hmm. others, like uh, the way that you interact with other people is a big part of that social conditioning. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So if we think about um, two five-year-old kids, one is a girl and one is a boy and they both have ADHD, right? So obviously they didn't just start having ADHD at, at five. Um, so they're in the kindergarten classroom for the first time together. Um, the boy is bouncing off the walls. Most adults will look at that boy and say, oh, he's just a rambunctious, energetic boy and will kind of like let him be until he starts breaking things and breaking rules and causing problems for the teacher. And then that teacher is going to say, whoa, buddy, you need some medication. You need some help to be more, you know, like a boy that you're supposed to be, right? And not to get off on too much of a tangent, but if that kid is not white, then that boy is more likely going to be labeled as a problem child rather than saying, hey, we need an ADHD assessment here for this kid, right? 
So just to kind of add another layer of the diversity in. But if you put a girl in there and the girl is really energetic, immediately that environment is going to say, you need to calm down. You need to sit in your chair. You need to have a quiet mouth. And so not in a loving, supportive way, but that girl is getting immediate feedback that her behavior is unacceptable and she needs to figure out a way to lock it up. And then that just gets repeated multiple times a day, every day of that girl's life until she eventually figures out that this isn't really what she's supposed to be experiencing on the inside, even if she can keep it together on the outside. So what kind of adaptations does that five-year-old make when a ton of people tell her, like, you know, you need to keep it together and stay quiet and stuff? So, <laughs> Yeah, so she might um, sit really, maybe not still still, but she might figure out a way to do something with her hands. Uh, she might pick at her nails. She might bite her nails. She might do things, other things with her body that are not as much of a problem to the people around her. Uh, she may start doodling. Uh, she might start doing things in her mind so that she's like daydreaming or thinking about something different or doing something more active, essentially, in her in her brain than um, with her body, which is just, it's not actually helpful because now that girl is so focused on not causing a problem, she's not focused on all the other things that you need to be doing, even in kindergarten. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so I mean, that's not awesome, but I, I love your explanation. So, <laughs> you, you know, what, what, basically what's happening is there's a certain kind of behavior which is sort of red flagged by the adults around you and that people will develop compensatory behaviors, masking, where yes. now mm -hmm. instead of like bouncing off the walls, I'm going to daydream in my head. And then since mm -hmm. it conforms to other people's opinions of what I should be doing, it's more acceptable, then the root problem never gets addressed. And then this girl exactly. grows up into a woman and then eventually may even seek mental health treatment or assessment. And then this is kind of what's sort of like sad about it. And I, I've certainly seen this too, that the better that you are at dealing with something like ADHD or even autism, mm -hmm. the less likely you are to get support, right? Because we, we don't, we're like, hey, if there's if you're doing okay, then why are you complaining? You don't really need help, et cetera. Yep. And if you think too about that five-year-old girl who learned if I can keep my body still, but I can kind of go off into my own world, academically, she's likely not going to be doing as well as she could have been doing if she was allowed to focus on, you know, other things. But then she gets written off as like, well, you know, girls don't typically perform academically as well as boys. So like, it's okay. She's just a little flighty. She's just a little ditzy. And so then you have the like, oh, well, I expect girls to be less smart than boys. So this is okay for her to flounder, even though her maybe like ability is actually higher than that. I see. Yeah. So then even, even the, the, problems that do exist are written off as flighty or ditzy like she's a ditz exactly right exactly and that's so fascinating because i wonder what percentage of people when i was growing up that people called ditzy i wonder how many of them were actually neurodivergent yep and then so, some sometimes i even wonder about this too that they sort of start leaning into that identity and conforming to what people want them to be absolutely mm -hmm. and so ditzy girls become cheerleaders and and so now like and then if you're a cheerleader then like maybe ADHD is not quite as applicable because you're you've picked a, an area of life where you're and so that's really interesting so I'm, I'm hearing that a lot of this stuff can really shape someone's life absolutely um so next question is about male mental health so I'm just a little bit curious kind of just more open-ended before we get to the specifics so uh you know there's it's not entirely clear exactly what's going on with male mental health so you know men have historically always committed suicide at at, at a very high rate um compared to women i think the suicidality has gone up some but it's actually hasn't skyrocketed or anything like that but we have uh you know a large number of men who are lonelier than they've ever been um less successful than they've traditionally been what do you think is like going on with going on with men nowadays Yeah, I think that um, 
as our society has evolved to uh, talk more about therapy, to talk more about mental health, to talk more about emotions, and to talk more about diversity, I think men have honestly been a little bit left out of, of that experience. So it's like, we're all going to talk more about therapy and emotions, but not men. And we're going to talk about diversity and, and the ways that um, people of color, the ways that women, the ways that, you know, all sorts of different right disabilities. I mean, you could go forever into that. And I'm not saying that, oh, those poor men, but like, I, I am actually saying that we, we have n not applied the same kind of like nuanced understanding um, of men and their needs, especially with the way that culture has evolved. So like, yay, now so many people are talking about emotions, except we still are not allowed to have men talk about their emotions. So there's a lot of, I think, um, maybe implicit, messaging for men that like no no you still don't get to do these things that everybody else now is allowed to do which is a bummer and w what do you mean when you say they're not allowed to talk about it what does that look like yeah so um i don't know the last time i had a man say that he was having a hard time or a hard day you know when you ask a man like oh how was your day i just I honestly can't remember in the moment, but then I have after the fact, right? Like a few months later have had men in my life come to me and be like, Oh, well, you know, that was a really hard time. The last time we saw each other, I was like, not in a good place. And I was like, wait, what are you kidding me? And you know, of course I think of myself as like pretty safe to talk to. I'm like, for God's sake, I'm a psychologist. Like feelings are safe around me. And yet I don't get that kind of information in the same way until it's like, Oh, now that I'm not in it, I can talk about it because now it's a little bit safer because I can still be a man in that, mm. you know, way, traditional yeah. way. It's interesting because having a hard day, I, I found that um, I've witnessed this a lot and I've experienced it in my own life that I have to work really hard to communicate to people that I'm having difficulty in a way that does not get shot down. I feel like I have yes. to like walk a tightrope. Otherwise, like, People just, I get blamed for it, basically. So if I say I'm having a, yes. a hard day, people will sort of be like, kind of like, what are you complaining about? You've got so much stuff going for you. Um, and, and so it's it's interesting because I also get a lot of problem solving from people around me. Yes. Where, where if I say like, hey, I'm struggling, they'll be like, well, then you should do this or you should do this or you should do this. And it, it's very, very hard for people to sit with... Uh, like my negative emotions. And especially mm -hmm. if I express something like, so I've, I've also been conditioned not to express anything but frustration or anger outwardly because that's mm -hmm. like an acceptable masculine emotion. So even the mm -hmm. way that I experience anxiety can sometimes be like on the angry end of the spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, if, if I do experience anxiety, there's a lot of like, you need to stop worrying because oftentimes when I experience anxiety, I will try to fix the circumstance that causes my anxiety, which will then create a lot of pushback because now I'm trying to orchestrate something around me. I'm trying to say like, okay, this particular thing is worrying me, so let me fix that. And then other people may not want that quote unquote fixed. So I, I found that mm -hmm. it's actually, it takes a lot of work and, and even some amount of training um, in terms of like me actually educating some of the people in my life about like, when I'm yeah. communicating emotions, like this is actually what I'm communicating. And it's like, if I yeah. don't say it in the right way, then people like won't take it seriously. Or yes. they'll, they'll leave which it as is, my responsibility to fix. Right. Which, I mean, it's just so isolating, right? Mm -hmm. um, because then it's like my entire, I mean, as a man, your entire inner world kind of doesn't matter. And that's, that's really lonely. What do you mean by that? Well, like you were saying, right? So um, if I s express any emotion other than anger, people are alarmed or like dismissive, right? Well, you know, that's not that big of a deal or you have other things going on. And so, you know, thinking back to the rainbow, you like did a tiny little foray into one of the, and that arguably my current emotional state in this moment is not that intimate, right? We're not all the way into the center. Um, 
but just opening up to say, hey, here is something that I'm experiencing emotionally on the inside. And then the immediate messaging from the environment is absolutely not. It's not a big deal. Get over it. Let it go. Oh, do you need me to fix it for you? I mean, how would you ever keep going, right? How would you ever keep going into the more intimate components? Um, and how do you ever get the social support that we all biologically need? to have our emotions respected and processed uh, um, adaptively. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of going back to women for a second, I'm kind of curious about something. So uh, more and more, so, we, you know, we work, we're, we're kind of in the gaming community and the experiences of women in the gaming community are like quite toxic usually. So for example, like I can't remember seeing so I, I asked a group of people recently, like, why aren't there any, like, female pro gamers? And there may be female pro gamers, and I'm just not familiar with their sport. But, like, most of the major sports that I follow don't have female pro gamers. And, and you know, when I talk to women in the gaming space who are people like uh, casters or talent, or you know, they'll be involved, um, but they're just not part of a professional team. It, what I really hear time and time again is that there's just it's just a very toxic space. And even when we interview women in our community just about what it's like to be a female gamer, you know, like you're not allowed to use voice chat. People, even the people who are nice are like invasively so, right? So it's like, like they'll, you know, they won't, they won't tell you to get in the kitchen and make them a sandwich, but afterward they'll start DMing you and like, they'll be like extra nice. And then they'll like want to talk about, and then they'll start trauma dumping or something like that. And you're like, you know, I'm just here to play a game. Um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, what's going on with women nowadays and like, how did we get here and what can we do about it? Yeah, I think, um, oh, I, I think in the, in the gaming community, I think a part of it is, um, this is just the way I think I'm supposed to act, um, as a male towards a female, um, without any of that social reciprocity. So I don't have the opportunity to get that immediate negative feedback. A lot of women are socialized to say, I'm okay, this is nice, yes, I'm gonna smile, um, until I don't. So you kind of get this really um, yeah, toxic uh, series of interactions that maybe don't represent what either of those individuals is really wanting to kind of like talk about or connect with, right? Then the the other piece there too is is also that as we were just talking about like, you know, men and opening up and sharing their own experiences for a largely male community to see a female, right? To say like, "Oh my gosh, maybe this person is safe," right? They're a woman, they do feelings, right? Cuz women do feelings. Um maybe I, I could open up and they would nurture me or they would respond in a way that's more what they're looking for. And so then women do end up getting um, intensely trauma dumped on a regular basis when they are just like, no, this is not my like, this isn't maybe my social connection space. This is my fun space. This is my gaming space. Yeah. Wow. So that that's really interesting. I never thought about that angle before that essentially men's inability to articulate and sit with each other's emotions makes it so that when a woman enters the lobby, it's like, okay, this person is safe and can, can do emotions. Yeah. This, this right? person can do and, emotions. Yeah. So um, that would be really overwhelming as a, a su substantial minority to go into that and to, and then of course, if I reject somebody or say like hey simmer down i don't this isn't what i'm looking for then it's really easy to lean into the oh i know how to hurt you or i know how to kind of hit back kind of a thing and so there's just not a lot of positive reactions um michaela i'm wondering do you want to try just switching back to wi-fi and see if it's stabilized for a second because this has been going great but now it's getting kind of blurry um Okay. Also, my dog is barking a little bit, so I apologize if you can hear that. It's all good. Um, yeah, awesome. So, 
And anything else that you want to kind of just like, what's going on with women nowadays? Like, what, what do you think are the common things that they struggle with? What makes it hard to be a woman um, in today's world? Gosh. Um, I mean, of course, as a woman, I can see lots of things, but I think, I think the, to rather than kind of diving into a lot of small things, I think as well, our, our whole society is changing so much. Right. And so, um, people are getting married later on average, people are having children, uh, later, if at all, there are more options for what a successful adult looks like. Um, yes, as a man, but also as a woman where traditionally, right? So we had like the, oh, women in the workplace movement, right? But what we only evolved to say women could work, but didn't necessarily attend to the fact that that also means that we need to, if I take on something new, I need to let go of other things. Otherwise my plate is so big, right? So you have women looking at, oh, to be a successful adult, I have to uh, have a job, earn money, have a career, um, and have kids and cook and clean and manage a household, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So when women entered the workforce, in theory, we would have figured out a way to redistribute the domestic load. Um, and I think we're only now kind of working on doing that. But then we have that toxic masculinity component of, like, oh, but men aren't allowed to be stay home parents. Right. Men aren't allowed to clean the house because that makes them weak or what have you so it's a uh, we're in growing pains i think a lot of growing pains. and so women are just trying to figure out what is it how are we going to do this in new and different ways basically that is healthy and and w so the growing pains are basically so and i i see this a lot with my patients who are women because um, those are the people that I think I, I tend to know the best. And also like some friends of mine where if you kind of look at it like now, yeah, I mean, just that you have to do it all. I, I, I love the way that you kind of said that when we added something to our plate, we didn't take anything. I mean, I say we, but y'all added something to your plate and you didn't necessarily take something off. And so what I see a lot is that 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 necessary shift can create a lot of friction and challenges in other parts of your life. So I, I, the number of women who are freezing their eggs, who I know either both professionally yeah. or just like in my personal life is like skyrocketing. Um, yeah. You know, sort of this idea of, like you said, we're kind of like getting older or we're like, it's we're sort of getting older later. We're becoming independent later. We're yeah. dating later. We're marrying later. We're becoming financially independent later. And there mm -hmm. is a biological pressure and there's a lot of like identity that I see that that's a real struggle mm -hmm. because I want to be a woman. I want to have it all. You know, I want to have kids one day. Um, there, There's no shortage of judgment if you don't have kids or delaying having kids. You know, a lot of people will ask, like, when are you having kids and, you know, when, are, you know, when when are you and your partner going to start having sex without a condom? Um, but, you know, right. <laughs> and like, you know, what's and, and so there's just all these like implicit expectations that are put on women. Um, and I think you're spot on, too, that I think I think it's sort of like we're in this weird kind of like state of flux. And I really love that you're sort of emphasizing that the dust is really settling because I, um, I, I think that it's one of the challenges of being a man nowadays is that I think still the majority of women expect you to earn more than they do. Mm -hmm. when that's as more and more women enter the workplace, that's just becoming statistically improbable or impossible. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I know, for example, that more than 50% of medical students are now women and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. More than 50% of people in college, more than 50% of people who graduate from college are women. And, and so as a dude, like you're not allowed to say like, I want to be a stay at home dad. Like that's not acceptable. Right. Um, right. And, and so I, I really love how you're kind of emphasizing that things are changing and we're changing and we sort of signed up for stuff without really realizing what it's going to cost us. Yeah. And I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it, the irony is like, as you were describing, yeah, it's actually not okay to be a stay at home dad, even though it's actually far more accessible now than it was, right? Because you could have a female partner who is earning a good wage that can support a family 
and that then and it's 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 so um like reinforced in the media too because you'll see this like um you know the way that the headlines are phrased right like um men are feeling so threatened by when women earning more money and like in my both personal and professional life men say i am not threatened by the fact that i can have a partner who i can really financially rely on and women are like we do not care at all we are not upset that we're earning more than men sometimes right it's not that women are always earning more but that the media is like putting this messaging out and you know the media is such a weird term but we're seeing all these messages that say that like that are kind of trying to keep us in that status quo from like 20 50 years ago when we're like now nah, we're ready to we're ready to push past this we're all actually kind of okay with this yeah so there was <laughs> uh and anyway, I just saw a comment in chat and I was debating whether to toss that your way, but I think we'll move on. Um, is there anything that in particular that you wanted to kind of talk about or share today? I think we're kind of at our halfway point. So I just wanted to, you know, anything that you, mm. uh, we've got more questions, but just wanted to give you space <clears throat> if you wanted it. Yeah, I, th I think we're hitting a lot of the things that, uh, you know, just by asking some of these questions, like, I think my brain kind of naturally is like, Ooh, let me like weave in some of the things that I'm interested in or excited about. But yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I'm, I'm hearing there's, isn't anything explicit that you want to talk no, about we're good to... any threads that you want to pick up on or explore, dive further into? Um, I mean, the only thing that, that, uh, I guess is still in my mind when we kind of circling back to the neurodivergence question, I, I used my example for ADHD, but I do think that um, the autism spectrum is another form of neurodivergence that is different enough that I think is it just important to also kind of give an example for how that applies Yeah. Um, in the sense of, um, so autism spectrum disorder at, at its core is really a deficit in like social, we'll just say understanding, connection, um, et cetera. So, um, and understanding that girls are consistently expected to play in social ways. So even, you know, very, very early on, girls have baby dolls, right? Um, and they're supposed to be together and boys are supposed to play sports and, you know, play with action figures. And then of course, the way that those uh, fun experiences evolve over time. So a girl born with autism spectrum is going to have a lot more like uh, social influence to say, no, you have to be socially oriented. You have to be socially mm -hmm. oriented. You have to interact with others. Um, and to a degree, there's like a little bit of like the treatment that would help support autism is involved there, but it's not actually treatment because it's like, hey, I'm gonna help you just enough to have the mask on, not enough to have meaningful support and change and learning and growth. I will also say, I I think that neurodivergence is only a problem because of the ways that our society is currently built, um, and that maybe there's a lot more room for healthy, completely functional people with on the spectrum and people with ADHD and other kinds of neurodivergence that we might not have names for yet. Um, but I feel like that's like a whole separate wormhole I could jump into. So <laughs> awesome. Um, so we've got some questions about trauma. Um, yeah. So how common is childhood emotional neglect? Are mental health professionals being taught about childhood emotional neglect or is it a niche area? And what can we do to educate parents about childhood emotional neglect? Yeah. Um, so as far as how common childhood emotional neglect is, um, I really should have that number on the top of my head because I just taught a trauma class last year. Um and I can't remember. Um, I wouldn't say it's rare, though. It, it is unfortunately more common than we would hope, of course. Um, and the other thing about child um, childhood emotional neglect is that it is so hard to like measure and prove that I would suspect that the numbers associated with that are significantly higher than what we currently have documented through you know the cdc and the nimh right um and the reason that i say that is because um 
how do you, you know, the question of how do you prove emotional neglect and how do you measure emotional neglect? Because the thing is, is that there are parents who are fully present constantly who could also possibly be engaging in childhood emotional neglect for their kids. And are like, it's just this massive mismatch between what a kid needs and what a parent is doing. Um, and then that kid's emotional needs are not remotely being met, even though if you look at a picture of the family, they just seem like things are going well. Hmm. And um, so a kind of another question, how do you know when a coping mechanism crosses into unhealthy behavior? When it's causing problems. Um, and, and so I think let's use like a, uh, I'm going to say like alcohol, right? So you come home, you know, you, you have a glass of something and it's maybe it's to take the edge off. Maybe it's just to have a good time. Maybe it's because you like the flavor. Um, now, when you don't have that glass of alcohol, do you notice that you're more irritable? Do you notice that you shut down more? Do you notice that uh, you have trouble sleeping or things like that, right? So that the that alcohol has not just been like, oh, this one thing that I do sometimes, but now not having it, I'm thinking about it. I'm obsessing over it. I'm feeling not good because I want it and I can't have it. I think that, that that's like one way to figure that out. Um, also, if you're doing a coping skill that whether in the short term or a little bit longer afterwards, so whether 15 minutes after you do a coping skill or an hour after you've done that coping skill, if you feel bad about that, that would probably say that maybe that coping skill has become a little bit unhealthy. Hmm. So it's kind of your response to the coping skill after the fact and whether it's kind of causing more problems down the line. Yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of curious because I, I, I really love uh, Dr. Thordars and your perspective because I think one of the challenges we have in, in our community right now is that I'm a dude and you know, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I find that oftentimes like when I'm thinking about and I've worked with you know, about half of my patients historically have been women. So I, in some sense, I know a lot. I mean, I, I feel competent enough to help women in my practice. Sure. But I think that even just talking to you today, there are angles on the intersection between being a woman and a lot of the issues that we're facing, including mental health, that I, I find really refreshing. Like, I think this piece of like socialization um, so I've looked at the research that says that, you know, women are socialized in a particular way, but I, I'm not able to quite connect the dots because I don't have that lived experience. And I, mm -hmm. I'd love to just ask you about sort of like that female perspective and what you've seen as a clinician and, and stuff like that. Is that cool? Just about all kinds of random things. Yeah. So can sure. I talk about like substance use and mm -hmm. being a woman? Like, what do you think is, are there gender specific intersections with addictions and substance use? Hmm. And if the answer is no, then I'll, you know, I've got a thousand questions. Yeah. 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 Uh, so interestingly, I think to me, and, and I will say we're at the fringe of my like research based knowledge. So this is uh, combining some of the research, but a lot more maybe anecdotal, right? Um, a lot of female substance use has an intersection with body image stuff. So, um, I'm going to go drink some alcohol tonight. I'm also going to skip lunch because then I won't have like bloating or because skipping lunch is cool when you're a girl so that you can kind of like maintain that trim figure you're looking for. And for anybody who's ever made the mistake or intentionally done it of drinking alcohol on an empty stomach, whoa, <laughs> right? Um, so it's a real different experience. Um, and then, of course, well, you know you're going to be drinking, and that's calories. So then I'm going to eat less on intentionally, uh, which can then lead to um, a whole host of problems. Now, does that make you more likely to become substance dependent on alcohol? I don't know necessarily the answer to that question, although there, yeah, I'll stop there. Um, and then with other drugs, right? So like the uppers, so um, Coke. Uh, meth, like those kinds of things are going to get you going. And um, those are also going to help you lose weight. And so I think that there's, you know, 
of the females, both in my practice and unfortunately in my personal life, who also use cocaine and sometimes maybe in larger quantities than one would uh, call like just partying, um, there is a big component of the fact that like, I like that this keeps me on the thinner side of things. And so I think that that's, that's an intersection that I think maybe is not always in, on the mind of men. Yeah. And so when you're dealing with someone who's got substance based issues due to, um, you know, when there's a, a body component to it, a body uh, emphasis component, body dysmorphia component, uh, how does that inform your practice? Oh, yeah. Um, so to me, when I'm thinking about how do we tackle a problem, um, I think a lot of times our initial thought is let's go for the the surface stuff, like the stuff that's really easy to see. So with this, that would be like drinking. Like, obviously, you need to uh, drink less, you know, do less Coke, whatever it is, right? Obviously, and, do less Coke. <laughs> I mean, obviously. <laughs> I think we'd all benefit from that. But, <laughs> um, but I think that the, the, the actually the bigger danger there is the like, I kind of hate the way that I look or I don't uh, like myself or I, I'm worried about the way that my body looks, right? And what I have found, and I don't necessarily, well, no, I know this is helpful, right? So rather than saying like, I'm going to like hyper-focus on stop drinking and here are all the ways we're going to get you to stop drinking, right? But if instead we focus on how do we teach you to love your body and how do we teach you to take healthy steps for your body to feel healthy, the top level thing, it kind of fades away. I'm not saying it's like a magical cure, but it does, it's less of an issue because I'm not accidentally having five drinks because I wasn't immediately intoxicated off of one drink because I had a healthy meal and I had a better ability to judge when do I say no to the next beverage, right? Um, so I think that's like, how do you think about a problem area and maybe what's underneath that and can I start by tackling that core, more core thing. Yeah, I, it, it's interesting because I've noticed that as well, just like doing a lot of uh, addictions work that I, I just have a better intuitive sense for what's driving male addiction than I do for what's driving female addiction. Um, mm. and, and just because I, I know, you know, like we were kind of talking about sort of like sharing my emotional struggles is difficult. So I sort of like know what to target. But I, I have right. found similarly that targeting body image or just how you feel about yourself and even issues of like sexuality and and sort mm -hmm. of um with my uh, female patients just their relationship with their body their relationship with the intersection or the value of their body towards other people whether that's mm -hmm. that's as a child rearing a child generating factory or if it's <laughs> sexual in nature you know I, i've kind of seen all of that so I think that's, yeah. that's really helpful to sort of think about what's underneath fueling the addiction. Yeah. Um, let me just kind of think. I, I love that answer so much. Now I'm sort of thinking through another list of diagnoses that, you know, so what what about like technology usage, internet usage, gaming addiction, um, a anything specific that you think uh, women who interface with technology, do you think there's a unique way that it affects women? I mean, we're back to body image is a big one, not in the gaming. Um, although there are, I mean, I love me some real good, very attractive female gaming uh, avatars and women are, uh, female characters are pretty sexualized, right? So there's a lot of that kind of like body reinforcement kinds of things. Um, but I think, uh, I think there's a, and I'm not actually sure that this is unique to girl, females. So you you tell me, but um, I think there's a, a pretty big like social anxiety component of, I don't, I'm too scared of interacting with people in real life. And so online, even though, as we've mentioned, there are some kind of like toxic elements of interacting online, um, it's a way to interact on uh, with other people that is maybe easier if I have a really kind of raging social anxiety, especially because a lot of, um, actually some of the girls that I work with do use male avatars or male, male sounding screen names 
probably to avoid some of that like toxic element um, to it. But then of course you can't use voice chat if you are a uh, female and then you sound like it, even though you're using a male name. So, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I think there is an element that's shared among social anxiety, but I, I do think there are some gender specific things that I've seen. So the first is that, so I, I've had some patients who are men who were sexually assaulted and, mm. you know, sexual assault is always devastating. But one of the things that really shocked me is learning how much of the exception that is for men and how it's like the norm for women, right? I, I don't know mm. if the number is above 50%, so I, I don't know if it's like, but, it, you know, the, the, the and, and there could be some problems with the statistics there in terms of men not coming forward when they're sexually assaulted mm -hmm. or we're actually normalized as men to think that those things aren't sexual assault. I, mm -hmm. I would say even more so than even women nowadays. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, even if you look at, once again, media, like you'll have situations of uh, a male student having sex with, we don't call, we don't use the word rape if a male student is having sex mm. with a female teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so even with, with the way that our language is, but I, I think one thing that I've come to really appreciate is like that moving through the world is sometimes more physically dangerous for women, just like mm -hmm. flatly. Um, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes young girls even are sexualized or as soon as they start hitting puberty, like there's a lot of sexualization that goes on. Um, and not to say that it can't happen for men as well. And I'm sure that you know, we do other things to men that are bad. But I, I think for women that, that the world itself is a more dangerous place. So I see this mm -hmm. a lot also because what, what's starting to happen is I think men are, especially toxic predatory men are getting better at hiding it. And so then what, what I've sort of noticed with a lot of the women that I work with is that they start to distrust the gender of men. And the reason for that is because the signals that they normally use to differentiate good men and bad men are becoming less effective as men become better at deception. And you even have like online courses in communities that will offer didactic instruction into like how to deceive women into mm -hmm. how to coerce women, all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of weird, but like as there's almost this like arms race going on between deceptive capabilities. And since there's actually like a an industry around how to get mm -hmm. laid and how to deceive women by telling them what they want to hear. And what we're sort of seeing societally, like I've wondered this, I don't know that this is true, is a compensatory like we can't trust any men. Um, I, I, I think I see other versions of that, too, because it's not only that, you know, men deceive women. I think a lot of women are very deceptive and, and there are lots mm -hmm. of cases of, of, you know, people finding out later that they're not actually the biological father of their children and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I do think that one of the things I've come to appreciate is that, like, as a dude, like when I go out on the street, like I'm not worried about my safety mm. in a way that there's a baseline fear of the real world, which seems to be higher in, right. in the women that I've worked with compared to the men. And I think that kind of thing drives them potentially more to online interactions because you're physically safe in an online space usually. Yeah, absolutely. I think also you bring up an interesting point with the, the trauma element in that, um, and I'm not sure that this is uh, gender divergent, but um, gaming and an online living we'll say is a great way to not live in my current life and so if i'm a person who's experienced um a lot of trauma and especially if it's been interpersonal trauma then i would rather just live in a completely different world where i can be whoever i want to be i can connect with whoever i want to be connect with without any of the real world dangers that that i have already learned face me um, in my physical um, environment. So I definitely think that there's probably elements of trauma that that fuel some of that. Like, why wouldn't I? I would way rather live in my safe, completely controllable online world, of course, to a degree, than in this physical world where I, I there's so many questions. And, and how would you try to help someone who's in that situation where, you know, I prefer this safe online environment to the real world right yeah. which makes perfect sense but yeah I, I think 
starting there and saying like, do you actually want to change this? Or is this messaging that you think you're supposed to? Because if you can live a productive life in your definition of productive and happy and healthy, where you 90% of your interactions are online and 10% are, okay, I'm gonna dabble in the real world and make sure I eat and use the bathroom kinds of things. Honestly, like go for it. If, if that is meeting your goals and you feel good, right? Forget, shed all the societal, that's not real life. What is real, right? Um, now, if a person said, yes, I do wanna reduce my time online because here are the things that I'm missing, that I do want, that I'm, I'm not able to achieve these goals, then I would work on how do we help you, especially if there's that trauma lens involved, how do we start by finding your safety cues? How do we, because like you said, safety cues are way more complicated these days than they used to be. So safety cues meaning, how can I look in my environment and assess this is safe versus this is not? There is an adult male five feet away from me. How do I know that I am physically safe versus not? Um, and then working through those kinds of things um, and then practicing, right? Um, so that might be, let's hop on. And I love telehealth and all of the online stuff because it really opened up mental health practice in my opinion, because we could, you know, hop on a, a FaceTime or a, a telehealth chat thing and go to places. And I could be sitting with my patient who is like, okay, I'm in a coffee shop. I'm feeling anxious. I don't know. And so I could sit with them and walk them through. What are your cues? What are you noticing? Walk me through this. What do you feel in your body now? Do we want to trust that and leave or do we want to not trust that? And so I think that, um, yeah, I, I completely lost my train of thought because I feel like I'm rambling, but like, yes. Yeah, yeah no, I love it. I, I think that you actually anticipated and answered my next question. Um, okay. So, and I was just going to ask you to explain a little bit about what do safety cues mean, but I'm, I'm hearing you that, that, you, you know, basically the signals that used to reassure us in the real world are becoming more complicated. Yes. And so feeling safe in the real world is becoming harder. And, and yes. to really dig into that and really start to recognize that there may be parts of me, especially if we're talking about a history of trauma, where just because my body or my brain or my mind is telling me that something is unsafe doesn't mean that it is unsafe. It just means, right. going back to what you said at the beginning about, this is just what my brain learned at an earlier time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I see that a lot in people who, you know, especially when you're talking about parental relationships and things like that, where like love gets tangled up with some amount of abuse and, mm -hmm. and, and that there can be very real love with abuse. And that just mm -hmm. confuses the hell out of people mm -hmm. as they start to, because now love is something that is to be feared. And so as you start to enter romantic relationships, you've got, you know, as that love starts to come, you start to worry about, okay, when's the other shoe going to drop? Yes. And then uh, not trusting it if the other shoe doesn't drop, right? Yeah. So if it is just, too good to be true that just means it's a healthy love or a healthy relationship and then ending up running away from that because you're like well this isn't right then um and and that can be really hard to work through yeah when you have somebody who's had so many unhealthy relationships who gets into a healthy relationship and then they're constantly second guessing everything and having to say okay so what do you and i can tell people what i think is healthy all day long what do I really know about somebody else's preferences? So it's really about like kind of figuring out, helping somebody else figure out, does this feel healthy? What does healthy look like? Do you want that? Because sometimes we think what we think is healthy is just like the copy paste of what we've had before. And we don't even have the idea that that wasn't healthy to begin with. So my bar is a little bit skewed. Yeah, I, I have a, that triggered a thought, but I'm having trouble articulating it just about, you know, I, I think sometimes when we're looking for something, we don't really articulate what we're looking for. So I, I think a good example of this is like, you can say to yourself, I want a healthy relationship. And then if you sit down and you really ask this person, what does a healthy relationship look like? 
And someone with a history of trauma, I found that this question, they, they freeze on. They don't even know how to articulate it. And then the really beautiful thing about getting them to articulate, like, what would a healthy relationship look like? And then getting them to actually articulate, because they don't know in instinctively. That's the problem, is that most of us know what a red flag looks like because we grew up in a society or in a family that was full of green flags. And this is why you get people asking for advice on the internet. They're like, is this okay? And then a thousand people will tell them it's not okay. Huge red flag, run. And then people are like, I don't understand how you could be so stupid. Why would you be in this relationship? It's because they were never taught to see they're colorblind. Right. You know, they can't tell the difference. They're red, green, colorblind. Poor dudes out there. <laughs> and, totally. And, and so one of the really interesting things is that when I work with people and I ask them, okay, what does a healthy relationship look like? And then what we tend to discover is that they've had those relationships before, but a healthy relationship on paper did not reassure them and evoked all kinds of negative stuff that actually caused them to retreat or even push away their partner. Like I've had, yes. you know, patients who are afraid of my partner's going to leave me. My partner's going to leave me. My partner's going to leave me. Yes. You're going to leave me. No, I won't. You're going to leave me. No, I won't. You're going to leave me. Look, this is driving me insane. I don't know what I can do to reassure you. And they're like, yes. I knew it. I knew you. Yes. No, I'm not trying to leave you. No, I knew yes. it. And then they drive yes. their partner crazy and their partner leaves. And then they're like, I knew it all along. Yes. Yes, totally. That You're making me laugh so much because I was literally just working with a, a patient like a week or two ago and we were talking about healthy relationship and what does that look like? And she was saying how she really needs a partner who is um, who likes watching her flirt with other people. And I was like, oh, that's that's an interesting <laughs> desire inequality. Like, tell me more about that, right? And it was, we eventually got to, I'm so insecure that my partner actually wants me that when I do a thing that makes him feel threatened and then he reacts and like, you know, comes to me, that feels good. That's that reassurance. And so we had an interesting conversation after that about whether that sounded healthy. And sometimes that's the value of talking, whether with a mental health professional or not, but the value of saying things out loud and then sometimes having them said back to you. Sometimes all I do is say something out loud. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that, that's clearly a bad decision now. And there's biological reasons for this, right? Like our brain processes information differently when we speak it and when we hear it. And so sometimes having that dialogue can really illuminate like, Oh, yeah, maybe that was not actually my best choice. Yeah, that sounds, uh, yeah, it reminds me. I, I, I love doing therapy with people for reasons like that. You know, this sort of idea that, yeah, so if I can evoke jealousy in my partner, that's how I feel, that's how I can get guaranteed or this insecure part of me can feel reassured, yes. right? right? So like jealousy is something that I use to bind someone to evoke behaviors in them that will yes. make me feel reassured. Mm -hmm. And then the problem, though, is that if I continually evoke jealousy in my partner, it's going to drive him insane. Yes. And then and that doesn't leave. feel good. <laughs> yes. yes. And then I will feel insecure, which yes. means that I have to evoke more jealousy. It wasn't enough jealousy that I was invoking, right. because if I really made him jealous, then they would really stay. So now, now yes. it's time to up the ante. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. I. <laughs> it reminds me, I don't know if you're familiar with the repetition compulsion, but th there's some weird esoteric literature from psychotherapy about why people uh -huh. basically keep on making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And they look uh -huh. at their life and they're like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know how I end up in this situation. And it's because of something that you said, which is like, yeah. you know, that we don't realize what we're doing and but if you really start to articulate and pay attention to yourself, you'll be able to see like how these pieces lay out and then hopefully yeah. you can get some help in piecing them together. Yeah. Um, cool. So we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so can we talk a little bit about parenting? Yeah. Uh, so, oh, actually there's, there's one that's too good to pass up. Would you be able to explain the difference between CPTSD and a personality disorder? When does trauma oh. become a part of the personality? And I realize that's a Ooh. tough one. Yeah. Uh, I think, 
I think it's really hard for complex PTSD to not become part of the personality and, and just thinking about um, the, the things that we've already discussed so far, right, is that my, my brain and body went through something intense and super scary. And so I created some learning around that. Um, if you've been through one major trauma, you are at higher likelihood of having another, especially as a child. And so then you end up layering unsafe messaging and unsafe learning on and on and on. And then, it, I mean, what even does a personality mean then at that point in time? Like, how could you say that, like, this is, I mean, I, I, that's just so inextricable. You can't really pull those things apart. And so uh, there's a lot of stigma around personality disorders um, as kind of like, you can't change them and you're just stuck with them for life. And we now know that that's like pretty wrong. Um, and it's really hard, right? It's really hard to relearn and shed a life, literally a lifetime's worth of learning that was done in the context of safety, right? So these are the things that our brain holds on with the tightest because this is, they need, our brain needs to keep us alive. So that trauma-based learning is gonna be the hardest to let go of because that means I'm opening myself up to the vulnerability of being hurt again. And so it just, re it requires a very skilled therapist um, and a really determined person because it's, it's excruciating work to kind of, whether it's personality disorder treatment or complex PTSD, right? Like both sets of those treatments are really, really hard work that you got to kind of like gear up for make sure you take a break from if you need a break, right? Like it's okay to make a little bit of progress, take a break and then get back to it. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I would kind of echo that. I, I think that one thing we have to remember about when does one diagnosis cross over into the other is that, I know it sounds kind of weird, but diagnoses are not real things. They're like, <laughs> they're like just sets of labels that we apply to one thing. And so who you are, I mean, if you look at just about every person, almost every personality disorder, maybe schizoid is a little bit different, but, um, it, you know, just about narcissism, borderline, all of our cluster B stuff is heavily tied to trauma. So trauma is a risk factor for personality disorder. Trauma is, a, is what goes on in CPTSD. And I think we're just starting to kind of like look at different sides of the same object, but the object is the same. We're just looking at it from this perspective or this perspective. And, and th that's interesting. I, I guess I, I wonder if just my experience has been different, but I, I tend to find that people can make actually a remarkable amount of progress with personality disorders in a relatively short amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. And and I, I'm wondering about that now, but, and personality can absolutely change. I, I think I was looking at some research that yes. showed that 91% of people with BPD, the natural course of the illness 91% don't qualify 10 years after the point of diagnosis. That does not surprise me at all. Um, and, and it's it, even like two years is 30 or 40% remission kind of. Yeah. So I think a big driver of the differences there is the connection to good services. So that would make sense why in your experience, people can make really big changes. You're probably really good at your job. And you probably have a referral network or people that you can connect patients with that are really good at their jobs. Absolutely. There is, there's not a lot of quality control in our field, unfortunately. And I think you end up with people who get labeled as personality disorder and then kind of written off even by their caregivers. And so it's, well, I know I'm not really going to be able to help you. So I'll just do this thing where I meet with you once a week. And then, you know, I don't, right. So I, 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 I thank you for kind of like piecing that out that you can make and you can also make mm, meaningful change in a relatively brief period of time for CPS, CP, CPTSD, but you really need a good clinician um, for, for both of those, I think. Well, I think the other kind of difference is, is not just cl access to clinical services, but general stability. So I think most, oh, yeah. most of my patients, now that I think about it, had like a roof over their heads. Right. Um, and and were able to get I mean, not not everybody was super financially secure by any means, but I, I would say that like food and shelter were not right. huge challenges. They were not in persistently abusive relationships. Um, right. so, so I think that they could operate from a place of stability, which makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about parenting and, and kids for a second. 
So how can you balance a kid's technology exposure these days? It seems like a really hard thing to do where on one end, kids become iPad babies because of what seems to be too much dopamine and stimulus. Yet on the other hand, um, it's important for kids to learn about technology and keep up with their peers. So how do you find that balance of technology usage? Yeah. Um, I mean, balance, I think, is the key word, right? So that you and then as the younger the kid, the more the shared use of technology. So there is one or two, maybe I'm going to just say one really interesting study that was done with parents of I want to say it was like I want to say it was like 11 and 12 year old, but I bet you it was 12 and 13 year old, which it doesn't. Sorry, I'm getting stuck on details. Um, kids where before the kid got their own social media account, the parents did this like, I don't know, three month thing where they used the parent's social media account together. And so they were going through the news feed or whatever, you know, the things are, and then narrating, ooh, do we like this one? Do we wanna like it? What does it mean if we like it? Do we wanna comment? What do we wanna comment on it? And then essentially like the shared experience of, teaching right we teach our kids everything but with social media we just hand them a device and say here you go or we hand them a gaming system and say merry christmas or you know whatever it is and so i wonder if using that just one tiny study as like a like a thought inspiration is when you give your kid an ipad first of all okay ipad kids yes it it can be a problem immediate gratification blah 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 there is so much good educational programming and interactive experiencing experiences that you can do uh, for littler kids. Just don't do it all the time, right? Um, and the more you do it together, the more you as a parent can kind of see like, eh, I'm not really sure how much value this adds to my child's life versus some of the other things um, that, that may be able to add value. Um, but yeah, I think also share, how often do parents like, let me tell you how many parents I have in my office who I say the word Minecraft and they like roll their eyes. Minecraft is cool. Okay. There are so many incredible things that kids can do with Minecraft. And if you dismiss, first of all, you're maybe discouraging your kid from being a brilliant fill in the blank, right? Cause a lot of the online gaming skills can translate to real world applications, forgetting the fact that Technology is a very real industry these days and a lucrative one. So I just think, how do you monitor and foster your kids learning around their technology use rather than just saying, hey, here, have a thing? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I find that the same is true even when I'm working with my kids, that a lot of what we do is around like awareness. So they don't um, you know, we'll sort of even, I'll ask them questions like, okay, like, do you want to play a game today? Yeah, let's play a game. Okay. Like, and then after we play for half an hour or an hour, are we still having fun or do you want to stop? No. Are you still having fun? I don't know if I'm having fun, but I don't want to stop. So hold yes. on a second. Let's take a, like, let's try to understand what's going on. Like, do you think it would be more fun if we took a break for a little while or, and then we'll like, take a break or we'll keep playing and then we'll go out and and run around or whatever go to the playground and then we'll kind of ask like okay so now 30 minutes into the playground would you rather be at home playing or are you happy being here and and i think really just calling attention to the kid being aware of -hmm. what something does or doesn't do to them um Mm -hmm. is huge and i i'd never heard of people using social media like a kid using you know my social media account or us using it together, but it makes perfect sense. We t- yeah. teach our kids how to clean up after themselves. We teach them how to cook. We teach them how to swim. We teach them how to read and write, and we're not teaching them anything about technology usage. Yeah. That's that's brilliant. Um, so what, in your opinion, is the most harmful parenting style slash method that is normalized and pushed by society today? Examples include oh. tough love, spanking, iPad babysitter, helicopter parenting, or even something like gentle parenting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a whole lot of research about how spanking is not super helpful, but I also don't know that we're really popularizing that these days. I think for me, the thing that I see consistently, and this is probably age five to 25 that I'm seeing this, um, is the, 
I think it's called lawnmower parenting, actually. Um, I've only ever heard this from like two other parents. So I don't know where they came up with this um, label, but essentially this idea of parents who mow the, mow the way. So they are clearing every obstacle for their child um, so that their child never has to fail, never has to have hard conversations, never has to advocate for themselves. Um, and in some ways never really even has to think for themselves, which then that's where you get into the young adults who have what our field is calling like the failure to launch uh, experience where they magically become adults and then they don't magically suddenly know how to do everything for themselves because they had a whole life where they never got to do that. Or you get the, the kids who by adolescence are terrified of making mistakes and are, are living in this perfectionism bubble that is is paralyzing. And it's because they never had to make a mistake. Their parents checked their homework three times before they turned it in at kindergarten. And so they never, they've been getting a hundred percent their whole life. Um, but like that that's not sustainable as a human being to have your parents do everything for you. Um, and so I think that's probably the most harmful because failure and making mistakes and thinking for yourself and doing things independently are arguably some of the most important things we can do as human beings. Yeah, that's so interesting. Because I, I, can you give us a couple of examples of what lawnmower parenting may look like? Because some of that I yeah. imagine sounds like being a good parent. Yes, yes. So, um, for example, like your your kid comes home. Uh, I'm gonna go real early, like second grade and has a spelling test that they uh, spelled a couple things wrong, but maybe it's not really they spelled it wrong, their handwriting was a little bit messy. And so the parent contacts the teacher and says, I can't believe you took off points for this. This is a spelling test. And they very clearly spelled it correctly, but you took off points because you're grading for handwriting on a spelling test. That on the surface, there's actually nothing wrong with that, right? Like, yes. And the message that that parent is accidentally setting is in second grade, right? Where you are, you're basically just learning, right? Um, you still need to be perfect. You need, it is not an okay grade unless it is 100%. Um, and I'm not even going to have a conversation with my kid about it. I, mama bear, right? I'm going to go straight to the teacher. And if the teacher doesn't respond, you know I'm going to the principal and complaining about this teacher. And so it it turns into this. Now, a lot of times we think the second grade kid, they don't even know. This is this is not on their radar. And I promise you, you're wrong. If you think your kid doesn't understand what you're doing or saying, I promise you, you're wrong. Uh, because kids understand so much more and hear so much more than we think they do. Uh, great. That just sounds like some serious nightmare parenting. <laughs> Complaining <laughs> to your kid's second grade teacher on a technicality for a grade. I think it also sends the message of if you get points taken off, what you should do is make a problem for authority so that it can get corrected instead of like improving your handwriting or learning how to spell. Exactly. Exactly. Because it's not life, you know, like when you get to a job, your job isn't just about your performance on the job duties. It's also about the way you treat your coworkers and can you show up on time? And if somebody tells you you did something wrong, can you say, thanks, I'll try again next time and do it better rather than yelling and saying, you're a bad boss or you're a bad coworker or all these other things that seem extraneous, but really a job is more than just one component. And I think that that's, you know, if you look back at just starting in second grade, but moving all the way up, yeah, it's a spelling test. But there are criteria beyond spelling that matter, right? Yeah, write your name at the top of the paper. Those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think the big irony that I'm hearing from you is that we sort of want our kids to be successful. And one of the things that parents can actually do is if we sort of think about what's the job of parenting, the par job of par a parent is to prepare their child to be successful in life. Right. And so I think it's kind of tricky because if we think about how do we know whether we are preparing our child to be successful based on whether they are successful or not, right? And so what then ends up happening is you start aiming for success. Yes. And the more that you control variables to be successful, 
the more ironically you are not preparing them to succeed. So it's yes. almost like cheating on the test. And, and how do we know whether you're learning the material? Well, you get a good grade, so let's start cheating. And I, I've seen this a lot where, where failure to launch or almost like prolonged infantilization. Yeah. Um, especially for like a lot of kids who are actually very capable. And what yes. happens is they get put into these prep schools. They have all these tutors and stuff like that. So it's like all of the frontal lobe function of organizing yep. my life and resisting my will, like, you know, developing willpower to force myself to study gets solved by my parents because I've got a math tutor on Monday, an mm -hmm. English tutor on Tuesday. And why do I want, why do they want all this? So that I can be in honors classes so that I can be on the varsity team so I can do all this stuff. And they'll, they'll sort of like try to push and support a kid to be well-rounded and also to outcompete their peers Right. Mm -hmm. Because if I've got a math tutor on Monday and an English tutor on Tuesday and something Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, then you will you have a competitive advantage over the other kids. And if you have a competitive mm -hmm. advantage, you will be more successful on paper. And what mm -hmm. parents are actually yes. doing is shooting their kids in the foot, because once the kid gets to college, then they're like they start to flounder some. Yep. Or the workplace. Right. If they're not going to go to college, if they get to the workplace and then all of a sudden it's like, wait, I thought I was getting this. And what's what's this? um happening so yeah i i like to tell parents we always want our kids to fail when the stakes are small so we want them to not wake up in time for their 8 a.m class their sophomore year of high school rather than miss their first class of the day every day in college or get written up at work or, or get fired because they couldn't make it to their shift on time and so those are way bigger stakes than like, okay, being a little late to high school a few times, because then you get also the corrective experience of, oh my gosh, I was late. I walked in late. People looked at me, you know, the, the teacher was a little mad at me, but those are low grade, right? Risks. Yeah. That's awesome. I can say hi to her. Yes. Is okay? yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think uh, we have a guest who wants to say hi. Hi, <laughs> Hi. Okay. <laughs> you did awesome. And I'm so oh, glad thank you. you. Us. Thank you. Thank you. Do they know our How We Met story? They do not. No. So I met Dr. Thorderson at the APA. You were blowing everyone out of the water. You were patiently waiting. You were the last speaker. <laughs> and then you just showed everyone up. Um, with just how much you know and how much experience you have. And I, I thought it was awesome. Um, it, it was about, I think, kind of the hardest cases, right, in childhood mm -hmm. adolescent settings. And yeah. I had just come out of a conference that basically could have just been titled Bring Back Benzos. And I was, like, floored that people were like, benzos are fine. <laughs> and then I was like, I need to go to a different room. I was so mad. Um <laughs> And then I got to meet you, and I was so happy. I think you got to move closer to the mic. It's oh, I have to move closer. Yeah. <laughs> How much of that did we get? We, well, I mean, they got I it. Heard it was it. just quiet. That's okay. Okay. Just if you're going to continue to talk, then the setup <laughs> is orchestrated. I, I can All move. Right. Yeah, you you're going to have to. No, I mean, um, I can get up. <laughs> yeah, that's fine now. Okay. But anyway, it's such a pleasure to have you on the scientific advisory board with us, and also I'm so glad we got to do this. We have a lot of women in our community that were like. Hello, can we get another perspective? And so Yay. it was great to have your perspective here, and I hope we can do more. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you. Can we get yeah. some claps and chat for Michaela? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kruthi. <laughs> Um So, uh, 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 Michaela, do you want to... So I don't know if you have a social media presence or not, but, like, when people come on, they are allowed to share, you know, where people can find them if they've got questions and stuff. Um, so if you want to tell people where you work and stuff, if you want people from the Internet to come find you, you can do that. But I don't know... I, I know that you're, you know, you're, like, a full-time clinician and you've got, like, a job where you help people yeah. who are suicidal. Um, yeah. But if you do want to share, you know, where people can find you or follow you on Twitter or whatever, you can absolutely do that. 
Yeah, I don't have a huge social media presence, actually. Um, I am Googleable. I have a, a sprinkling of webinars through the hospital that I work for at Children's Hospital of Orange County that you can look up. We also have a pretty robust set of resources for parents, teens, uh, teachers. So uh, might be a good place to find, hopefully, uh, actually good information. Yeah. Okay. So that's good to know. And let's have yeah. another conversation about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nothing and, for me directly. Okay. So, that you, you know, we'll, we'll think about whether that needs to change. Um, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on. I really love your perspective. You know, I, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, if you have any last thoughts or questions, you're welcome to ask them. Otherwise, we're done for the day. And we really appreciate your time and all of your help. And we look forward to downloading more of your wisdom in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Some amazing questions that came through today. So it's yeah. really exciting and fun to do. And we've got way more, I'm sure. So we'll we'll sort of, <laughs> um, we'll kind of, I'll talk to chat some and we'll sort of get a sense of what they appreciated the most about this. And then maybe we can try to kind of do this again, but in a more like sort of focused way where we can sort of sure. figure out, you know, how to, how to do this a little bit better. But thank you so much for coming on and have a good yeah. rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Say bye, chat. Okay, she's gone. All right, GG. All right, chat. That was great. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I, I, I really, I think Dr. Thorson's fantastic, and uh, absolutely. Like, like Ruthie was saying, there's a great story because she was like, we were at a conference. Okay, I, I shall not name which one. And just there, there's like a lot of changes going on in the world of like mental health. Like, if we look at how we as humans our mental health is evolving. It's like evolving, right? And and what I really love about Dr. Thorderson's perspective is she thinks about problems like not in isolation, not as simply a diagnosis. She thinks about like, okay, what are the societal influences that are kind of compounding within you to create this particular human? I also like that she focuses on behavioral change, right? And and there's like a couple of other things I, that, that I just really like about her therapeutic style. So one is like, you know, hey, if you want to sit at home and, and be on the internet like for 90, 99% of your life and that's the life you want to live, go for it. So I, I think it's really about understanding your perspective and understanding what you want and then like giving you a path to really focus on behavior change. And her clinical experience, by the way, I think is, is you know, certainly shapes that. So... Right now, I don't know if y'all caught that, but I mean, her day job is is trying to help people who want to kill themselves, right? So there's a very strong behavioral component. And if we think about people who are suicidal, these are people who frequently have the worst hands dealt to them in the game of life. And so these are people that may not have stable. And she was like, you know, these are some of the most, uh, you know, difficult to treat things. And I was like, I, I mean, I actually really like it. It seems like people make progress and it's it's apples and oranges. Right? It doesn't mean that I'm an exceptional therapist. It just means that my patients are in a better spot. So, And there's just so much about personality disorders and stuff that I, I also think that there's a stigma against them that they're really hard to treat. And that too, I think the reason they're really hard to treat is because we don't treat them in the right way. Right, So we have a system of psychiatry that if you look at from like the 1960s until about now, there was, there was a biological revolution in psychiatry. And so we started using medications and we were like, oh, crap, this actually works. And so if you look at where is the most research investment in psychiatry, it's in pharmacology. It's in things like transcra uh, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, things like IV ketamine. I heard there's this IV ketamine clinic that is in a bus that drives up to literally Wall Street in New York the street that is named Wall. And bankers come down during their lunch hour and get infused with ketamine to deal with the crises in their life and the, the toxicity in their job. I don't know if that's actually true or not. That's what I heard. Okay? And so we have all these biological advancements with the advancement of neuroscience. And the problem is that pharmacology doesn't work for personality disorders. So are they hard to treat? Yeah. Yeah. But I think part of the reason they're so hard to treat is because we just haven't spent a whole lot of time in treating them. And even if you say, okay, if you look at like 
research funding. What are you talking about? You have to remember that research funding includes all the money that pharmaceutical companies are dumping into stuff, right? If we look at the total amount of humanity and what humanity is investing in, we have a whole industry that is about medications and pills. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think in a lot of ways, it's a good thing, right? That's why we can do things like develop vaccines and take cholesterol medication and, you know, take nitrous oxide if you're having a heart attack, which keeps you from dying. There's a lot of good stuff that comes out of the pharmaceutical industry. But this is why I think personality disorders are hard to treat because we haven't treated them in the right way. We haven't invested in learning how to understand them. And what I really love about Dr. Thorderson's perspective is she's like, you know, a lot of technology addiction is about social anxiety. Makes sense. And a lot of, um, what did she say? She was talking about substance use. Yeah, so a lot of substance behaviors in women start with something related to body image. And so I think those kinds of like nuggets are the things that it really takes to unlock an unsolvable problem, right? It seems really hard to fix. And that's because we just don't have the right key. And then suddenly it opens. And then you can make a lot of progress in a very short amount of time. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you all very much for coming today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We also did a stream with Dr. Horowitz recently. Strongly recommend y'all check that out. If you guys, speaking of dangers of the pharmaceutical industry, has an awesome perspective on SSRIs, um, was one of the, uh, you know, the major authors in a very cool paper that came out in Molecular Psychiatry about how the serotonin hypothesis, the serotonin deficiency of hypothesis for mood disorder, uh, serotonin deficiency hypothesis for mood disorders are, is basically false as his perspective. Um, and has a lot of really interesting ideas, so y'all should definitely check that out. And for us as well, let us know what is helpful to y'all. And especially if someone like Dr. Horowitz or Dr. Thorderson, if they're ever going to come back, what kinds of questions would y'all want us to ask? Um, was male loneliness covered first? I think we touched on it some. Uh, but, um, yeah. How can we let you know? I guess post on subreddit. Maybe we can make a, you know, a, a, and I think we got these questions somehow. So you can post on our subreddit. You can also tune into our socials because I think we let people know that Dr. Thorson is coming and we collected questions ahead of time. Um, And the one thing, if y'all take nothing else away, the one thing I would really take away is I thought this ra rainbow stuff was revolutionary. You guys caught that. Like this whole idea that, okay, like what I love about it is like here's a system to figure out how to socialize properly with people and form connections, right? It's like seven colors of the rainbow. And red is like really, really deep stuff, trauma dumping, trauma bonding, this kind of like deepest stuff in your life and like violet or you know purple or whatever is like the light stuff like how was your day and what you want to do is you want to move down one color and get more and more intimate over time we want to get yellow and then we want to get orange and, and stuff like that right but at each step of the way so start with how's the weather and then wait for them to reciprocate and if they reciprocate and they if you ask them how's your day and they say how's your day then you can move on and then move one layer lower and one layer lower I think this is the kind of stuff it's hard to describe, but I think this is what we do basically in group coaching, which is like you meet with people over 16 weeks, let's say. And so over that 16 week time span, at the beginning, you're all strangers. And at the end, everyone is very close. I wouldn't say you're friends because we actually actively discourage friendship in coaching because friends hang out with each other, right? There's other parts of the relationship. So we don't want y'all to be friends. We want you to have a place where you can be kind of almost like professional colleagues where y'all are, you know, you're part, you're in a party and the goal of the party is to fix this problem, to put together your life. And so over time, and I think this is why it's so effective is like over time, you learn all that stuff because there, there are guardrails that we won't let you go too far. We won't let you go too deep. We'll learn, we'll, a coach will step in if you are taking too much space. And we'll also, if you're not taking too much space and you don't know how to advocate for yourself and you don't know how to jump into a conversation, the coach will notice that and will point out, hey, what do y'all notice about 
this uh, who's being active in today's session and who's not being active. And then sort of give you the permission to step in. And at the very beginning, what we'll do, this is, I love this. We'll ask the person questions, right? So if you're kind of like in the back, we'll ask you, hey, is it okay? Like, or do you have stuff to share? Is it okay? And then we'll ask you questions to bring you in. Here's how I would do it. Here's how I've done it. And then later though, we're going to stop asking you questions. We're going to pull you in by asking you questions. And then later, we're going to expect you to step in on your own. And I even do this when I'm teaching, where when I work with our coaches, for example, I do case reviews. So we discuss case, you know, their, their clients and stuff and what they're having trouble with. And what I'll say is, okay, I'm going to ask a question and I don't want to hear from these four people because these are the people who always answer questions. And then I, So here's the question. And now other people have to step in. And so if you sort of think about it, there's a graduated way to develop social confidence. The problem is that we don't, it's not as simple as like watching a YouTube video because there's an application part, right? You can watch a video about it. You can know what the information is, but when the rubber hits the road, you don't actually like, you can't deal with those internal emotions. You've got to play with live ammo. And that's what we try to do, right? Live ammo, but safe area so that you can afford to make mistakes. You can afford to, you know, go at your own pace. You've got time. Right? So you don't have to rush things. And so if y'all are interested, definitely check that out. But I definitely think there's some kind of standalone lecture about this whole rainbow of, of social interaction that we're going to ping Dr. Thorson about. Um, and who are you rating, by the way? Questions? I mean, th thoughts? Who to raid? Rob is fine. I don't know what the name of the rainbow theory is, but I'm I'm intrigued. Um, Arab two two one is that the right one? Let's go. Okay, Super Mario Maker two. Let's go, chat. All right, take care, y'all. And um, I think we're streaming on Friday. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but stay tuned. Let me let me check. Actually, I think we're streaming. Yeah, so I think we're streaming uh, Friday evening, actually. So we'll see you all Friday evening, okay? Oh. Wait, did the raid get canceled? I misclicked chat. Hold on. You're with me. You're with me for a few more seconds. I'm so confused. Canceled giga. It's because I clicked, and it, you know if you click anywhere off of the window, it cancels the raid? Anyway. Take care. <laughs> Get wrecked, noobs.